Hi, my name is Mike Grinker. This is my associate, David, and we are here today to clarify thought. We'll be talking about aliens, body modification, and whatever might be up with the economy. Uh, and with that, where should we start? Well, it seems like there's a lot going on with people talking about aliens recently, man. The government... Not just people. <laughs> Not just people. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I mean, not just any people, but the Pentagon is giving briefings on unidentified aerial phenomena. Speaking of phenomenology, which we were covering last week, one could also interpret that as that they're not people, they're bureaucrats, but uh, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt for now. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's been pretty interesting having a lot of the concepts and, I, you know, speculations that have been going on for i don't even know hundreds of years probably and more recently probably in the last hundred years like more solid concepts of like there being ancient life out there in the universe that can travel seems like mostly with the invention of airplanes um, people have started to report these phenomena um, that even trained pilots are starting to experience. So let's take a quick look at a video that got released. We have tackled on these. It's pretty fascinating. From 60 minutes, nonetheless. UFOs, unidentified flying objects, are real. Bill, I think we're beyond that already. The government has already stated for the record that they're real. I'm not telling you that. The United States government is telling you that. Luis Ali That's pretty insane. <laughs> That's pretty insane. I don't really know yep. what to, to think of that. But well, I remember... I guess the real when, question is, why would they visit us in the first place? Hmm. Why, why does it matter? I, I think there are a lot of unstated assumptions to get to that point. Uh, I remember when the first Pentagon leaks came out a few years ago of the F-18, F-15, some sort of jet had recording of UFOs, UAPs, they're calling them now. And it, it was official. It was naval intelligence. Uh, it got leaked. It seemed like absolutely no one was surprised. We've, we, as a, as a society, have been more or less aware of this phenomena since the 50s. And as you said, it goes all the way back to planes and whatnot. I mean, However... Yeah. Sorry. It goes back millennia. We've always been seeing things fly around in the sky. Our interpretations have evolved along with our technology and our overall worldview. So now the default assumption is not spirits from another realm, but beings from another planet. And that, I still think, is speculation beyond the available data. Yeah, I think you're, you're right about that. I think that it's interesting that we move from the transition of super of the, I guess, uh, spiritual beings, like you said, or superficial beings, natural, supernatural, uh, extra non, dimensional, extra dimensional, paranormal, paranormal non physical. Mm -hmm. Um. Which still gets tossed around. Some people say that these aren't travelers from another planet, but from another dimension, one of many possible worlds. Sure, and I mean, that's something that we could talk about as well. Um, mm -hmm. 
I I mean that's an interesting that that would be an interesting uh, take on the possible world's conceptions that we have been levied by people like David Lewis. Um, and the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. Sure, I'm yeah I'm not capable of speaking on that. Um, <laughs> but po possibly it's also find somebody who is. It's also a nice. Uh, resolution of the free will determinism paradox in that every possible choice gets made in some universe ergo mm. right and i mean i think that what's interesting about uh aliens maybe as extra dimensional beings because i mean if you if you take the history channel um you know for anything right they, they all been saying that we've been depicting these things it flying through the sky for thousands of years. I think that's it probably as far fetched as some of the other things that people have said, but it's hard to know. I mean, it when you don't understand that things on their own free will can fly other than maybe birds or something like this. Um, it's hard to imagine that you construct mechanism um, when mechanism was so, um, basic that you would be able to extrapolate from the mechanism of your day um, using birds as like a jumping um, off point to then make the conclusion that there exists some group of people or society that can manifest a machine that does what birds do. Um, well, are they depicted in the shape of birds or are they depicted in the shapes of wheels i think it depends on who you, you know i mean it depends on what you take the the historical evidence from the history channel to be but it seems like it depends on what society um produced uh, those images uh and you know i mean you see wheels in india and you see wheels um in indian philosophy all the time everything is cyclical and um karmical so mm -hmm. seeing wheels so, is not a surprise there right no nah, and it could i mean it could be extrapolation it could be uh observation and then again assumptions on the basis of observation i've always appreciated the term well i've always appreciated the unidentified in unidentified flying object and i do think aerial phenomenon is a better term because uh, as we were talking about, phenomena aren't necessarily out there. Uh, all we know is that there is something that pilots have observed for decades that are also showing up on cameras now that is unidentified and behaving in ways that our technology can't replicate and that would presumably liquefy any biological uh, creatures within the vehicle if indeed it's a vehicle right right the these so these very fast changes in in speed going from mm -hmm. from thousands of miles an hour to zero and back to thousands of miles an hour again or changing direction without using a bank or something like this like some type of essentially implying some type of like inertial dampening te technology yeah, uh, or maybe they're just. I mean, ideally, right? They're probably if if they are actual alien devices, they're probably probes, and they're probably <laughs> there's probably no living beings in them at all. Uh, based on what well, we do, right? With our living be with our probes and our extraterrestrial devices on Mars and stuff like that, they're just there. There's no life there in them. Well, and that would solve at least some of the issues with interstellar travel in terms of the time required to do so, but certainly not all of them. Right. So, but again, that is still assuming that they are from another star system, which is elite. Right. Like, of course. I think. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely the, true. But the, 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 the most... question is why, if you can't explain them, then. Well, you look at what they're likely to be. So what's the most likely explanation, the simplest 
explanation is that they're human created. That they're a technology that some group of humans has developed and is deploying because that doesn't require any additional assumptions. It still requires that there be this outrageously advanced technology, but it doesn't require there be another species that has achieved outrageously advanced technology. Right. So, but there, there is an assumption then that there is a group of individuals who operate completely independently of any known government entity that is, <laughs> that that controls this technology, right? Like that's almost it, as absurd. Yeah, it, and then uses it to do what? To do so nothing. It it, yeah, just occasionally mess with aircraft for no apparent reason. It's just see that is to me is almost as absurd. Mm -hmm. And also doesn't fit with what we know of human behavior. Yeah, it like, doesn't make any with sense. This, no, it doesn't. No, because so, all of the spying that those things could be doing could be achieved with satellites. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem like there's any reasonable even there's it like we we abandoned very very fast aircraft for a reason. Right? The the oh, that's the, a good point. the aircraft that was going that was being produced by I think it was who makes the F22? Is it Lockheed Martin or Boeing? I think it's Lockheed Martin that makes the F-22. I don't recall. Let's find out here real quick. Are we talking about the trillion dollar... Uh, um, yeah, Super so Plane? Lockheed Martin makes the F-22. But there was another aircraft that was fighting against the F-22 Raptor because they always do head-to-head. -head. Mm. And it was by Lockheed Martin Skunk Works. And that aircraft has a still classified top speed. <laughs> 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 but uh, the Lockheed was building the plane for, like, I mean, the new generation fighter aircraft can do some insane stuff, right? Like, uh, anybody yep. who's seen Top Gun has seen what they, they talk about, these what these, gener these new generation aircraft can do with the thrust vectoring technology that they have on the engines, Ooh. right? That's what, that's what makes them able to like flip up and like fly behind you and then regain attitude and, and come after you like that. Some of the, just, you can like flying the plane sideways and things like this, like stuff that like seems humanly impossible to do with a fiction well, aircraft, but you can do with thrust vectoring because essentially you're flying with, two different control surfaces but we we don't make aircraft to do that anymore because we don't need to we don't need to fly over people's you know space and take pictures of them like we used to do in the sr-71 so it just doesn't seem to me that like i mean even if you encounter the the evidence for like human beings creating these it like you have to make even more steps it seems than to say like well maybe it's just like it's better explained by aliens than it is by human behavior kind of like what you may have been alluding to and it just doesn't make sense for what humans do yeah it doesn't and the the what is the easy or the who i guess is easily answered but the why is more complex whereas as you said for if it's if they're probes that makes perfect sense. And they're behaving more or less how we would expect a probe to behave. And yeah, that's actually assume... true. <laughs> they avoid in, in that evade and collect. Mm hmm. And occasionally seem confused. <laughs> and occasionally seem uh, confused, like shooting themselves into the ocean. Mm hmm. Well, and see, that's, that's where we get to my pet theory, because if, or my pet hypothesis, they uh, because if they are non-human, that doesn't necessarily imply they are non-terrestrial. Okay, so what are you going with for that? What I'm going with for that is that we know how ridiculous interstellar travel is uh, from a perspective of scale. And currently, while there's some theorizing as to warp drives or wormholes 
Uh, as far as we can tell, it's very it's effectively impossible to exceed the speed of light with a material object. And given and even, like the functional, like even if you could bend space, you still need more energy than like a whole solar system or something to do it. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> trying to do interstellar travel in a reasonable length of time with a reasonable amount of energy is absurd. Maybe maybe if you like waited for two black holes to collide and then you you somehow use the energy produced by that collision right to ride the wave ride the right? gravity wave but sure but then you would have to get to those two <laughs> supermassive black holes colliding mm -hmm. in the first place yeah and it would not be very <laughs> and then wherever you wound up it's like oh great you know we're here we're around some g-class star at the edge of the galaxy there's a couple of bipedal looking nuts down there i guess we should check it out it's Again, it's a simpler explanation is that the craft are from within the solar system. And given that, they could either be, I mean, maybe from Venus, uh, maybe from underground in Mars, maybe the moons of Jupiter, or from beneath our own oceans. And the one place where we know for a fact that there is life that has been evolving for a very, very long time and become very complicated is this planet. And we have not very, we, we've not achieved the level of detail in maps of the ocean floor that we have in maps of the rest of the solar system. I agree with so, that. Like a, yeah, I my agree pet with that. hypothesis is that the most likely explanation, I still think it's humans, but, I mean, hmm. <laughs> a more likely explanation is that if there's a non-human technology-using species, it's on the bottom of the ocean, and that they have taken a while to reach the point where they can explore the frigid near-vacuum of the Earth's surface. And to do so, they have to construct this highly advanced technology akin to what we had to come up with to get outside of the atmosphere. See, I've always thought that any, that there's that one of the filters for the great filter. And we can talk about um, some of the ideas that this guy has come up with. Um, his name is Robin Hansen. If anybody's familiar, he wrote the paper that established this, like, this concept on the great filter. And he's recently come out with another concept called the grabby aliens model which suggests that we may be just one of the first civilizations to exist that 13 billion years may just be the early cook time that the conditions we we really may be truly alone um in in the universe functionally alone at least insofar as that our our ability our our um our radio waves will in the um in the existence of our species will never reach another society or another civilization that could understand them because uh, i i for one actually think that uh, alien life is probably very common sure. i think that um that it's very likely that anywhere that has heat and chemistry um and any any type of friction it's everywhere fr exactly and any type of friction um and then the ability to have that type of um activity manifest with inside of what functionally is equivalent to a bubble um, yeah you need an the open thermodynamic Earth, system uh, you know, an ocean, a pond, right? I, you could be, uh, your sounds like you're going to get more scientific with this, but. Yes, you need, it's a dissipative system. You need an open thermodynamic system and a lot of different elements available. Yeah, uh, and I, I think combine. honestly that's enough. Mm -hmm. I, I honestly think that's probably enough to get singular cellular life. So why does he call it the grabby aliens hypothesis? Uh, we can go over that later. I want to. Uh, okay. I think I want to keep going with this specific sure. line of inquiry, if you don't mind. Oh, go for it. 
So we may well be alone in that it took this long to well, get heavy I elements. Mean, well, and... I mean, what I'm trying to go with this is that it seems to me that any civilization that exists on, like, a water world, like, for example, Europa, right? It's, I think it's likely there's life there. It's, oh, sure. it's likely we'll find life in those oceans. It's If they're dead, I would be so surprised. It's just, it would be astonishing with the tidal um, gravitational forces of Jupiter making that thing explode all the time and stuff. I mean, it's just... Seems... I mean, there could be too much going on there. Too much radiation, too much... Uh, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm not a biologist, and I don't... I don't know. I mean, no, let the, I, I can't wait to find out. We'll just say that. I think that, you know, anybody... I think that NASA's concepts for trying to get under the oceans and all that is fascinating. But it seems to me, and this could just be, um, you know, a bias on our technology, right? And the way that we understand, um, like, how to generate power, how to harness um, electricity, how to manage electricity, and how to manufacture things. It seems like a lot of that has to be done dry. And if it because well, a lot of all of our technology has extremely specific conditions for production. Yeah. Right? Like the the microchip revolution is mostly if not all just one company's ability to produce a special type of laser lithography machine that, you know, ASML produces a special machine. And the only reason that we have the modern age at the current scale that we do is because we understand how to vaporize tin at certain, to produce certain frequencies of light to etch shit onto chips. Right. Yep. And, the the manifestation of that machine itself is dependent on so many other processes that wouldn't exist in a in a water environment you can't forge steel in water right you you'd have you'd have to essentially create an environment that's similar to the one that we forge steel in right i it would be hard to imagine a chemical process that can be done underwater to forge steel. And that would take you all the way back to fire itself. Yeah, how do you even fire get fire? It. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, but here's the thing, right? There's volcanoes, right? There's, there's very large sources of heat. But the question is, you know, at certain points, like, how do you pr start producing advanced technology, right, without yep. with everything being wet? all the time yeah metal metallurgy itself would have to be either radically different or non-existent right and so you'd have to <laughs> maybe biochemistry way... or something yeah i mean maybe you could use biochemistry I don't know. well the technology tree would be different from the beginning in the same radically way that to, yeah. to, to speculate life on uh say titan where they have oceans of liquid methane and it rains does it rain? I, I forget. Iron? No, that's somewhere else. Anyways, <laughs> yeah. totally different. It's absolutely um, insane. <laughs> totally different uh, set of molecules to work with. So for life to exist there, obviously it couldn't be water-based. It would have to be based, the DNA itself would have to be based on a whole different chemical setup. And again, it's the question there is how do you create life without water? So a lot of astrobiologists have to are trying to come up with alter, alternate uh, chemical setups for synthesizing proteins and whatnot. And your point is well taken. You'd have to come up with an alternate means of producing heat and producing technologies, producing tools in, in a wet environment. I think that's the, I, just the biggest hurdle, but yeah, that doesn't mean it's not it's possible. The, no, it doesn't mean it's not possible. It's just that's, that's a major uh, question mark and a major unlikelihood. I think it is, in theory, possible for... Because uh, it's a set of problems. 
a set of problems that an intelligent tool user has to is presented with and starts by trial and error figuring out. Uh, did you see uh, what's the movie? Um, My Octopus Teacher. Nah, maybe. Is I would a documentary? Hi- yes, I would highly recommend you watch that documentary. It's it's fantastic, uh, and it's a documentarian going out every day for a year and developing studying one particular octopus and eventually developing a relationship and an interaction with this particular octopus, which he, he rates them. Um, he says cephalopods are, uh, well, not cephalopods. Octopi are about as intelligent as cats, which for a cephalopod is, it, it just doesn't, it's unreasonable. Uh, yeah, I would say they're they're about as clever as crows are because they can solve some really interesting problems. They're tool users, and he goes into that. He goes into the uh, geometric problem solving that they undertake in order to open up shells. They're um, for for mollusks for certain kind of uh, bivalves and whatnot. Uh, there's a very specific nerve that it has to cut with its beak in order to get the shell to open up. And it can do that every time, just boom, boom, find on the shell where it is. Um, and are we? Yeah, this is the, uh, some of the video, this is the trailer for it. Mm -hmm. For those people who are interested in checking out the video on Netflix. Damn it, we're playing without any audio since you were mm -hmm. still talking. Sorry. Yeah, you can see. No, absolutely. No, we're just going to leave it without the audio. Yeah, you can see that, you know, they earlier here, they were it was hiding with all these shells on it. Which in, in and of <laughs> itself is the... Yeah, I mean, I mean that's, a, that's a having a theory of mind. And then on top of that, um you know a concept that of like the limited understanding or right it's very interesting how how adaptive these creatures are cuttlefish too are super crazy their ability to match and their environment is absolutely insane over the course of about a year's worth of life they can yeah, they, they've evolved to be able to adapt to novel situations and learn things. So it's it's pretty astonishing. And there's there's no question that uh, life has been evolving in the oceans for longer than it has on land. And it is easily possible that cognition developed to an advanced degree in the ocean. Uh, like you said, the barrier is technology. Yeah, and if if that barrier were overcome, it would be radically different from the sort of technology we use. Uh, among other yeah. things, that probably if it's in the deep ocean, they probably wouldn't be very reliant on light. Well, it'd probably be, be chemistry and like genetically organized or something. You'd have to grow mm. everything, right? Mm. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah. Or at least that would be one potential solve. Yeah, I mean, to me, that would be that would be a huge way. I mean, because theoretically, you can you can make life make anything, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and some things are going to be easier in ocean environments, right? Because you, you have more pressure. You have more pressure. And more you don't heat. have as much of a, a a very specifically delineated notion of down. Like, you've still got a gravitational vector, but you can do a lot more in three dimensions. Especially if you're working, you know, theoretically, you know, maybe there's only certain things that can be manufactured at, you know, 5,000 or, you know, at the bottom of the Marianas Trench, yeah. for, for example. Mm -hmm. I, you know, who knows? And as things get more extreme, right, the, envir the, the types of, of devices that you could produce would be even more intense. Here's a video actually of this, of some of these craft that this was played to the Senate um, committee that was investigating this. 
and this is this is the video that they're playing for everybody you see that little blip there you see this right here this is what they're talking about <laughs> do you see it I, it's very small on my looking screen outside of a uh, civilian aircraft window is that what we're you see it but there's a little ball that just flies by and they can't mm -hmm. figure out what this little ball is. Here, let's see if we if we can see it again. They play this little ball over and over again. Um, there it is. There's a little ball right there. And they just can't figure out what this little ball is. Are you able to full screen that? I think so. Does it show full screen? It's just a on very little YouTube. ball here. Yeah, it's oh. the Navy explained new release video. I have it. It's oh, I see it. In here. Yeah, it's just this little ball. I see the little ball. Yeah, nobody knows <laughs> what it is. Right? I mean, yeah. here's the thing, though. Presumably. Right? Hmm. Here's here's the thing. Maybe it is a probe. Right? If I were making, you know, things that were gonna go test the environments of. Um, of objects that, uh, you know, planets in the sky that I saw, I would, you know, it would definitely be ideal to send little probes. And that actually brings me to this grabby aliens concept here. That we're going to not, we're going to try to avoid this part here. But this is a, a simulation of the grabby aliens model. So we're assuming... I don't think it's the speed of light, but I think you can actually see what the speed is. Oh, it is this, it is half the speed of light, it looks like. So in this amount of time, we see, all right, here, let's see, the transparent. We see all this interconnection. And that's right, that's where we're at right there. As far as the universe's age. Right, but life probably didn't start at the beginning of the universe. Almost certainly not. And iron didn't exist until or any element heavier yeah, than that's iron true. didn't exist until the first stars started going supernova. Right, and we don't know when that is currently, right? Because we haven't been able to look back. No, we. Oh no, we know pretty much exactly when that is. I just don't know off the top of my head. Do we know? Um, that would be fascinating. Yeah, because we know how long it takes for stars that heavy to go supernova. Like we know very, very clearly how long the, how how much time it takes for various astronomical processes to happen. Uh, I. Um, da, da, da. It, but it's several billion years, um, right? According to astronomy. dot com. So let's see when the first civilizations start to contact each other. Assuming this starts from when uh, life begins, and assuming that it begins at roughly the same time uh, across the universe, then it would take an additional several billion years. Now, the question is, is this accounting for inflation? It, universal inflation? Um, I'm going to go with I think so. Okay. Probably. And my understanding is that works different locally than it does... It's just, inflation is just a really weird concept. Mm. <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't get it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me at all. Hey, join the club. If somebody says they understand it, they get it, and it makes sense to them, they're lying. 
Yeah, if you're not, or, Alan or Goose, they're about or... to get a Nobel Prize. Yeah, well, I mean, you're either you're Alan Goose or Adriana Linde, right? The people who created the theory of inflationary cosmology. <laughs> oh yeah, they may have created. It. I doubt they understand it. They either. may not understand <laughs> it. They may not understand. As far it. as I can tell, it is not an understood phenomenon. It, uh, it seems to be mathematically understood. Like how it happens. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's the MIT has open course lectures on inflationary cosmology. I mean, they teach it. I mean, I know they know that it happens. I'm pretty and sure they, they understand. Can describe it. The I'm physical pretty... mechanism? I well, I don't think they anybody understands the physical mechanism. That's what I mean. Uh, um, but I I think there is mathematics that ex that describes it. I could be wrong. Oh yeah. I could be wrong. No, it's mathematically well described. We just don't know what causes it. Because that does seem to break the speed of light. Right. Um, I think... Anyways. Maybe we do. Uh, I feel like we do. I don't know. I'd have to get... I'd have to look in more into that. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have a solid answer for that. But I feel That's like it's pretty well understood. For another video. I feel like it's pretty well understood. <laughs> uh, I could be wrong. Worth saving for another video. I don't know how long it takes for neutron stars to merge and collide, which is what produces heavy elements. But it takes as long as it takes for neutron stars to form, which is at least several billion years. Right. So. So my my whole theory on this is that it, it, even if this grabby aliens models right and obviously i'm not a mathematician and or a cosmologist but i mean it, it, the question still is given that this mathematical model why are we not seeing anything and i mean maybe the answer is that we are right the answer is that what we're seeing is these you know these creatures these probes that's not what's predicted by the model, though. We would expect radio first. We would expect to uh, detect electromagnetic transmissions before we encountered physical objects, right? Yeah. Yeah, you would expect to. Unless they found a way to circumvent the light speed barrier, or they just... I don't know. Or, again, they, the technology could be explained as coming from underground and Mars if it's dry or figuring out some way to explain the probe coming from a watery environment, whether it's Europa or here, uh, would be the first step there. Otherwise, one would expect some sort of radio wave. Yeah, I mean, and maybe they just get redshifted out. They're just not powerful enough to be perceived. Yeah, if they're starting as radio, then they could just be completely... Because you would need a, an extremely powerful laser to send a coherent message. Like, an extremely powerful laser to send a coherent message between stars. If that's even possible. Yeah. It or you could like use some sort of signaling... Yeah, I mean, to Definitely. me, it seems like, and and it's even possible that you know there isn't there is intelligent life that has technology, but they have gone a completely different way, right? They've chosen instead to instead of uh, maybe the planet that they live on is just so perfect um, that. I mean, we have to imagine this, right? That this is a, it's certainly a possible world, right? Is it? it? It certainly must be a possible world. There must be some possible world that has a possible species that where the world just has so many conditions that are perfect for them that they don't need to develop a crazy amount of technology in order for people to live a better life. And where would the evolutionary pressure be for them to develop cognition at all? That being the case. Well, I think that's interesting that you assume that cognition is selected specifically by like 
predatoriness or like some type of adversary adversarial aspect of the environment i do i do assume i mean i don't uh, think, I think that there's any evidence to support that in in cogn- like you don't nobody ever proposes that as the reason that cognition exists we don't really know what, why cogn- they... nobody knows why cognition exists why spend so many so much sociality uh, actually i think is one of the main reasons that's been proposed why cognition exists now that i think about it okay one of the reasons that we're they think that we have such large brains is because of sociology because large brains are expensive large brains are extremely expensive yeah but so i they're... don't think it necessarily implies that they exist only to serve adversarial nature, like an adversarial nature. I'm, I'm not like computation I, itself is an adversarial. I think, is what I would argue. Neither is selection necessarily. Like natural selection doesn't have to be an adversarial process either. It's still a question of if you've got a creature spending a large amount of resources on a feature versus a creature that is not spending well, uh, a large amount of resources on a feature, there's usually an advantage to that feature. Otherwise, the creature spending fewer resources is going to be more successful. Well, I, I'm thinking of creatures like <clears throat> bonobos, right? Um, and the snow monkeys, right? That, like, they have it perfect, pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> Their environment is like so well, they're so well adapted to their environment and their environment hasn't changed really at all that most of their cognition is devoted to sociality, right? Sure. It's like grooming. And sociality, it's a very, very effective response to uh, survival. But to bonobos survival are considered, considered to be like the, one of the smartest animals. Absolutely. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that it's necessarily that intelligence and technology are necessarily related, even though I think they're highly correlated. Uh, Because I would argue that you can see intelligence in creatures that don't that have that intelligence mostly for sociality and not for tool making or. And and maybe like the tool making and stuff, that's like what really skyrockets the the level of, of understanding. But maybe just maybe sociality is sufficient. And if there is if there are other civilizations out there, they don't expand out at all. Um, because they don't ever develop the technology to do so. Because it's not in their interest for some reason. There's no pressure to do so. There's, there's no, no pressure. Need. Yeah, there's no pressure. I, I the, the, there are a couple of couple of claims there. Uh, one, technology, intelligence doesn't necessarily imply technology. I agree. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say that. That said, are you also claiming that technology does not necessarily imply intelligence? That if you have technology, you don't aren't necessarily intelligent. Yeah, that you could develop a technology without. Um, I mean, I guess I'm willing to admit that that's possible. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I I, I don't think that, like, yeah, I mean, like, one could come upon technology that was produced and not know how to use it, of course. Um, Are you saying that, like, perhaps, like, for example, the examples that Bergson gives of, like, um, creatures waiting for certain events to occur or creating traps and stuff like that? Um, just asking without knowing when you what said, they're doing when you said in uh intelligence doesn't necessarily correlate with technology i was just making sure like i, I was just clarifying that if you yeah. see a piece <laughs> yeah, of I'm technology abs- mm-hmm. specifically these uh unidentified aerial phenomena do you think those imply a high level of cognition at some level along like does their existence imply an agent uh an agent that sent them yes or they themselves being the agent Mm. or could they be purely natural phenomenon 
and sure. I'm distinguishing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. What do you mean then by natural phenomenon? Well, and that's because intelligence is also a natural phenomenon. But um, I guess it goes back to the question of selves and consciousness. Um, but we're, we've been assuming this whole time they're technology. And in keeping with that assumption, does that imply there is a creator of said technology? Or could they be, could they be the post-biological machine life? from one of these civilizations that is just scattered out into the stars. And that itself is both the probe and the being. Uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I would say that that would be close. That would definitely be closer to what I would think is happening. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be, if, I would say if they are alien life or whatever, um, alien of, in origin out of extrasolar, or whatever you want to call it, um, that there's all those implications. Yeah, absolutely, that they were created by something and that something did it for a reason and we may not understand what that reason is even necessarily. Um, they, yeah. They could be products of selection pressures applied to, again, a machine life that emerged that's a common hypothesis that eventually the biological life the tool users that build their technology create sentient artificial life which then proceeds to take off and and oh that's the new life forget about the biology entirely uh, yeah that's uh, and, uh, elon they... musk's proposition i think uh, mm -hmm. i mean he may not be the first one but he says something like humans are the bootloader for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. yeah and within the context of the grabby aliens graph, if I'm interpreting that correctly, uh, these could just be like seed pods. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe they were scattered at, you know, near light speed velocity. We're going to check out this star and this star. And yeah. every star that we've detected of planets around, we're going to send these guys out. We've uh, talked I about mean, that would... this. Project, yes, Project Starshot. Project Starshot is this idea. Mm. Here, I'll show you. Mm. I'll show you. We thought about doing this. We legitimately. Okay. Stephen Hawking thought of it. Was on board. This was a this was a thing for a while, man. Let me find it real quick, and I'll show oh. you. Yeah, we. If thought... we've thought of it, and if there's other life forms out there, uh, we're probably not the first ones to think of it. Because that's an almost universal truism. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's almost so fundamental. Uh, break, yeah, the breakthrough starshot is what it was called. No, okay. I'll watch this real quick, and I'll show you what they were talking about here. Oh, nice. This has been essentially abandoned. But to do that, the first interstellar right. spaceship will have to be extremely light and extremely fast. Pete Warden, the former head of NASA's Ames Lab, now leads the Starshot project. Well, the real question that we've got is, is there life elsewhere? Uh, are there other Earths? In Starshot's master plan... Yeah, so they were going to take this... These lasers, essentially, and create these solar sails, right? Like what Bill Nye made, that uses the energy from photons to propel it. And they were going to shoot these things off into space. We'll see what Which could take, says. like, two decades from now, a mothership orbiting Earth will launch a tiny probe called a nanocraft. The nanocraft will carry data-gathering electronics on a one-way mission to the Alpha Centauri system. Once outside the mothership, the nanocraft will inflate a spherical sail. Next, an Earth-based laser array will fire a tremendously powerful light beam at the spacecraft. In minutes, the laser will accelerate the nanocraft to a fifth the speed of light, so it can make the 26 million mile trip. So that, that I mean, that's essentially the concept there that we're referring to. 
And I mean, who's to say that a, another civilization significantly more advanced with significantly more resources or understanding of propulsion doesn't just send a whole bunch of little probes out? Because that that little, I mean, this thing doesn't seem big, right? Like it's it's just a little craft. You know, it looks like it could sample the atmosphere. You know, read communications. Who's even designed yeah, it's hard. communications? It's hard. Well, how would you design that? You'd ha you design something like that to be as versatile as possible and not to know what to expect. Which would beyond... make sense why it's a spear. Yep. <laughs> Which uh, gives it even and... more credence that it's probably not terrestrial. I just, I really, honest, I just don't, I, I just don't buy that we make these, that human beings make this stuff and nobody knows what it is. Or sea peoples. I don't buy the sea peoples hypothesis, unless you're talking about the sea peoples from like the Bronze Age. Which is no, totally I'm different. talking about cephalopod. I'm talking about highly intelligent, <laughs> deep sea non-human dna based organisms i mean that... i'm always willing to accept that we live in a possible world where that's true but until i actually encounter evidence to affirm that that's the case i'm willing to accept that i live in a possible world where that may be true and where aliens are probably more likely <laughs> well aliens are more like i'm looking at likelihoods in terms of like this star shot that's a very compelling uh case for and this probe, that would also suggest this probe is, well, wouldn't have to be that old. Well, that, so, it would do be they talk old. about? Do they talk about how to slow it down? What do you mean? Because the, they're firing oh. this laser at it, right? They're accelerating right, it. Right, right. Is it just doing a drive-by yeah. of Alpha Centauri at 9.9 yeah. 9 feet? Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, we're gone. Yep, that was um, that was the idea, and I think that's one of the reasons that they abandoned it. Because there's but, no guarantee you'll hit anything either. Well, the goal I think is to do a near miss. Right. But if yeah. you hit something, it's. I mean that that's going to cause an extinction level. Well, maybe not. I don't know. Something that size traveling that fast is going to get noticed for sure. But these unidentified aerial phenomenon clearly have a lot of control over inertia so it would make sense they could accelerate very quickly for a very long period of time and then just stop right so one could imagine if uh proxima centauri four light years it could get here in four years As, assuming there's life there otherwise assuming it traveled uh, we go at the out speed to of 10 light, years yeah. Yeah, or like 0. 0.999, and it wouldn't experience very much time elapsed at all. That's the other side of that coin, is that the perceived length of time to get somewhere is dramatically reduced the faster you're going. Right, but then you have to account for all the dust that you're going to run into. Yeah. I just, I, yeah. I, you know, and that, you know, and then you encounter that problem, and you're like, well... Where are all those aliens, man? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't make any sense. It you makes know? sense. I mean, that's a hard, that's a soluble problem. If we're looking right. at it in terms, well, I mean, the inertia thing, no. We don't know how they do that. But dust, use a, um, I don't know, use magnets. <laughs> use, use magnets. Use a warp tunnel. To, yeah, do something to just. Use to, a deflection to, to warp array. The dust around. Like yeah. they do in Starcraft uh -huh. or Star Trek. He's a deflector. Yeah. <laughs> Use the dust as power. Use a ram scoop to channel it into a fusion bottle that then spits it out the back end. Oh, well, see, there you go, man. You're you're solving. The... No, dust is again. It's a it's a difficult problem, but it's not one of these. Mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense how that's even possible. Problems. It's just engineering. Fair enough. It's it's like one of the it's it's not impossible. It's it's like a regular impossible. It's like it's not against the laws of physics, therefore possible. Yeah, it, it's, it's we don't know impossible. for a fact that it can't be done. Right. We know how to do it, or we can come up with any number of ways how to do it. It's just extraordinarily difficult. Right. Just regular impossible, not actually yeah. impossible. <laughs> Imp impractical. I don't remember who it was that was talking about that. 
uh yes yeah, they were saying like the 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 impossible is just something we haven't figured out how to do yet yeah it's very difficult we can do immediately impossible is going to take some time yes exactly exactly and that i think leads us into the, our next topic which is transhumanism something that we've just begun to really uh explore as cell phone technology has um become popular we've as as a human species i think um been modifying ourselves for a long time mostly as uh rites of passage for men um but also women um with extending necks tattoos lips piercings um filing of teeth um all sorts of um what some people might consider extreme or strange behavior that identifies um people with a certain group or um, ideology or both tribe mostly tribe uh, but recently um we've moved into a more dramatic period i would say i guess in human history where our attention is the uh the thing that's really started to become the thing we start to manipulate more and more by filling it with attention different... our attention yeah our behavior hmm. yeah uh welshin talked about the commodification of attention a lot mm. um and that itself has turned us into more transhumans than ever before we you well, i mean right now anybody who's watching this uh this podcast is completely aware of a situation that they would never have been aware of without the the help or aid of this technology that we use to transmit our information um we you know our ability to calculate send and receive information make decisions is all now augmented by these incredible computational machines that we've produced um so I, I guess I my question for you, Mike, is where do you think we're going? What's next? Um, do Video well, Game Society has anything to sh to share with us here? Or maybe that's not even relevant to your opinion. I think the first off, at the at the risk of being too broad, like you're right to start it off with tattoos and very early forms of body modification. Uh, I I would define I personally would define transhuman uh, that sort of behavior as using technology to modify the human body in ways that uh i choose a horrible phrase that gets thrown around in ways that nature didn't intend uh i think it's important to draw a distinction between the technologies we use like computers communication writing and whatnot and technologies that physically change the human being themselves uh like tattoos again if if you find if you find a hominid uh mummified somewhere okay this cool you can't really speculate much aside from maybe um looking at its cranial capacity things like that if you find a hominid with tattoos that says a lot and because it has clearly it is chosen as you described to undertake this change this permanent change to its body uh for presumably social and cultural reasons so how where are we going i do think that gaming culture with its emphasis on reaction time and the importance of having a high quality mouse and keyboard to get the reaction time as fast as possible uh eventually they're gonna they're they're, they're gonna cut that link, break through that barrier and make it make the brain to uh, computer interface as fast and direct as possible. 
Absolutely. And I think gaming is going to motivate it. It's going to be motivated by competition. Okay. Uh, one, simply because that tends to be a powerful motivator. Uh, leisurely gaming, people gaming by themselves, even if you're competing against the computer, there's still the idea is, uh, and I think the very biological idea is to win, and to win you generally need to do the thing before the other guy does the thing. Um, now, as far as yeah. Sociocultural things, it really it's going to depend on the individuals. You've got folks moving from tattoos to subdermal implants. Ah, this guy. Love this guy. So this is the type of uh of activity that you're anticipating is going to be occurring um in the future. And well, yeah, I, um I agree that there's a competitive element to it. Um I, wa I would just push back a little bit in that I think that the motivation for brain machine interface, at least in the initial, in, for what we're going to see in the next 20 years, is going to be motivated by um, helping people who are paralyzed walk again, helping people who can't move quadriplegics use technology again like this, uh, communicate again, be independent again, and uh, take back their lives again, hopefully. Uh, is the is the future of this technology that's the pray that's what we pray for right i mean hopefully we don't get the dystopian um the dystopian society where we live in a matrix and instead of outputs we get inputs and that's all that matters luckily we don't seem to understand the brain well enough right now to give inputs to it to produce phenomena reliably enough to to make manipulations not to say that that's not close um, but I, I hope that um, in the same way that chemical warfare um, has been banned by the chemists themselves, neuroscientists and people interested in this field of research ban the type of manipulative um, and uh, evil behaviors that we've seen from games like Diablo Immortal and other stuff like that, um, where the whole purpose of the mechanism is to extract as much money from you as possible by manipulating you. Oh, yeah. And also, we don't need brain implants to do that. We've got plenty of very effective mechanisms for doing that already. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. I'm just, I would just hope that as the technology develops, as it gets more embedded, as we start to, to put information in instead of taking information out and playing Pong, um, yeah, I think that... Yeah that fundamentally is something that we should strive for it's good to it's good to keep a keep an eye on that i think sure. what, and i sorry oh I, I completely agree with you on using the technology in order to benefit folks who ha, who need it uh, i think the elective usage of it is going to be what's utilized uh, to pay for that because uh, as far as extracting money goes from people, um, yes, and, and one hopes there will be foundations, uh, charitable organizations, that people will uh, gift these sorts of technologies and procedures to people. And even a lot of that, I suspect, will be funded by people who want it for themselves, maybe not because they need it, but because they're willing to pay to get some sort of edge or simply to have it for the sake of having it. Um, as with everything, it's going to be a mix. There, there will be some phenomenal benefits, uh, and there will also be exploitations of it. It'll Absolutely. be, it'll, I suspect it'll be like cell phones. It will go from a incredibly useful luxury item to something that you can barely function in society if you don't have. Right. So it won't even be, oh, we're going to use this to control your mind. It'll be, oh, you, you can't, you're not going to be able to shop or use our services or carry out basic functions in society if you haven't had these sorts of augmentations and procedures. Yeah, not a brain implant. Mm -hmm. That's insane to me. I just, I, I think that at all costs, we should avoid a society that exists in that way. I think that we need like to I have said, a more clean brain, uh, more clean interfaces that don't require that people 
get wires implanted in their brain by a robot. Mm. I again, it's it's where we went with cell phones. And would you? So I'll ask you: Would you voluntarily undergo that to get better at gaming? No. Would you voluntarily undergo that to be able to learn languages more rapidly? Mm. I would be worried about the uh, about the ability for them to input data into my brain at that point. Like you said, it's going to be a big input-output thing. It won't just be control, uh, but it'll also be, yeah, the re receiving information. Right. And like you said, given how uh, oh, wow. little we understand about learning and how memories are formed and stored, it would have to, I think even a language learning software, I don't think you'd be able to simply download in for data directly into a person's brain. You would have to create a simulation in which they are studying a language and then play that extremely quickly. Just because the way that humans learn thing is so holistic, it couldn't just, there's, there's a language center, there's Broca's area, but it's all experiential. Well, there's Wernicke and Broca's area. Mm -hmm. Broca's yeah. area produces the language, and Wernicke's area understands the language. Mm -hmm. So you would be, I guess, I mean, I, if they were able to somehow tap into my Wernicke's area and, like, give me a dictionary that was not local, but somehow accessible immediately i i would probably use that but at the same time i don't see how it's impossible for them to produce technologies that can predict my behavior sufficiently to know that i'm going to want that information externally at least um i think that that is probably something that i would value more then I would rather have a droid like a C-3PO than have mm. a Neuralink, I think is how I would answer that question. Okay. <laughs> right. I, I think Which... I would rather have my, my um, augmentations external from my body. Uh, that's my person. Right. That's my personal preference. Mm -hmm. But I mean, maybe, you know, just the ability to have that just instant, recognition yeah maybe yeah, direct knowledge and understanding because the human brain is still the most powerful computer that we're aware of right so i guess i i i guess the question would be what would the phenomenality of that experience be like would it be like right. me being able to use language now would i just instantly know all the words would i understand their meaning um would i be able to speak the language without knowing what i'm saying um, I guess all of these questions, I guess if it was attached to my Bernicke's area, I'd probably know what they all meant. But maybe you'd be the... able to speak the language without knowing what you're saying. That is a fascinating question. Yeah. And it seems like <laughs> that might be something that's possible. What if your interlocutor is the one who has this augmentation? So you can speak English and they understand, say, Mandarin, mm -hmm. how do you know what you're saying? Well, I think that that is a fundamental problem that everybody has when they're trying to transmit information. You can never know that the... This is like Shannon... I think this is a Shannon's information theory problem. Probably. Yeah, like how do you know that the information you're sending will be understood? Mm hmm right like how do you know that there's a match right and like you he gives this example with like waving flags right like waving a flag means certain things in certain contexts like if you're on a ship and you're waving a flag at somebody else that's a certain color it means a certain thing right or for passage or something like this right one could imagine that like uh you're trying to enter the enemy harbor and they give you a flag code that you need to respond they wave a red flag you wave a right a white flag Right. Um, but you don't know you need to rave a, a white flag. You rave the wet flag and they start shooting at you. Right. Um, yeah. 
So and that's why that because we have again the the translation software that we have already kind of sucks, but it's getting better. Yeah, it's and getting a lot so better. And so you can, it's getting a lot better. It's still yeah, but you can speak into the thing and then it will speak out in a different language. And like you said, it's externalized, uh, and it's not the same experience as knowing and understanding a language and communicating with somebody else. Right. Though you run into information theory problems even when two people are native speakers of the same language. Right, and that's kind of my point, I think, is that, like, that problem is always there, it seems. Mm -hmm. It's strange when two people have the same language, uh, that speak the same language, though. Yeah, with different reference for words. Uh, I think this is going to be... Oh, just that one of the things that's going to drive that, I, we were talking about physical uh, augmentation and uh, allowing people uh, to be physically mobile and able to interact with the world in that fashion and how that's going to be driving a lot of this technology. What you, What we're talking about now, as far as language learning, as far as gaining information, that's going to be a much more fine-grained, subtler extrapolation of helping folks with oh absolutely neurological damage um, right for the same reason that this victims. monkey can be recorded playing fortnite right for the same reason that right the for the same reason that they're recording this monkey playing fortnite is the same reason that eventually this technology will help people walk which is eventually how this technology will have the understanding of the brain to manipulate it in a sufficient manner to produce the phenomenological effects that we're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. I yeah. couldn't agree so with you one, more. If you, when the, the first step is going to be, so for instance, if somebody um, suffers a stroke and suffers damage to their capacity to speak um, fully effectively, and then if there's a possible way to augment that so that they can regain that uh, efficacy, that will inform how we can take a fully uh, abled brain and enhance that speaking capability. Right. Do you see what I mean? Like the one, the in terms of drivers, in terms of... Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's likely that yeah. we'll start to see that in, um, it once it, once we see Neuralink starting to be used in like, uh, with like for DBS, for deep brain stimulation and uh possibly helping people with aphasia um uh you know uh who knows what what we could unlock once we can start putting little wires in your brain i mean uh, and that i think is where i would be willing i would actually be willing to um make that jump right um say i get diagnosed with parkinson's disease i'm absolutely 100 percent down put that put that thing in my brain dude um you know because DBS already works quite well, um, and you know, microactivation of the substantia nigra I think would be just life-saving for a lot of people, or uh, just like the ability to go in and have uh, deeper monitoring of activity in those regions. Um, I think would just be so great. So, absolutely, as the technology gets better, as um, you know, as they're able to re start to take more information from my brain, which is what's interesting about, about this video specifically, the, um, the complex, what, what we'll notice is earlier when we saw this monkey playing, he was playing Pong, which is, uh, which, which is just a one axis, um, motion. But if you noticed in the last two videos we've seen of this monkey, he's using this joystick to play. Oh, uh, oh well, yeah, the joystick is disconnected, but he still no, has no, no, to no. use the joy. Yeah, that one down there. I'm pretty sure this joystick it's... still works. No, it's it's not plugged in. That's the whole point. He still has to use it as a reference for himself. I'm assuming the monkey is male, um, but you can see oh, the it is wire unplugged. is not plugged in. <laughs> He learned how to play using the joystick, and then oh, they unplugged the joystick. that's super fascinating. Yep. Did he learn? Is yep. the other one the same way? 
Yeah, so and this one for is the plugged viewer, in. I don't... In this one, it's plugged in. Okay, so I didn't miss it on this one. That's fascinating. Okay, so he learned... I wonder if that's just like an ancillary uh, thing there. I think it's a... Not not necessarily a crutch. I forget what the technical term is, but needing to use it's his it's uh, his reference point. Mm hmm But for this one, he is using it. Yeah, yeah I'm you sure can he's tell it, you can tell he is using it because he pushed it down mm -hmm. on accident and hit the bottom. Okay, so that's interesting. So I was gonna try to point out that for this one specifically they hadn't actually taught him. They hadn't figured out how to track this. No, oh, that's what they're yet. doing right now. They they're trying are, to figure out how to do it. What they did, they set it up. They had him play with the joystick and recorded. Right, that's what they're doing right now. It seems responded. like yeah, yeah, is right. the recording process. Right, and then they once they've recorded that, they unplug it, and instead of recording, they because they know even, now based on the recording right. what um, the they've brain gotten did. really good at this. Yep. That's yeah, really recording. Mm -hmm. Well, what I was trying to get at That's was, what it looks like. Well, see, now it's plugged in. When do they unplug it? Now they unplugged it. Interesting. I wonder if the video is the same. Yeah, let's go back. Okay. Yeah, are you sure that this is not simply a uh, edited? No, no, because on this video, then they unplug it too, and he still plays right. with the joystick. <laughs> but he doesn't yeah. need it, like you said. That's so he crazy. Doesn't know he doesn't need it. He doesn't uh, know he doesn't need it. So that is probably the most interesting part about what human beings can do, is that we can then take on ourselves as an object doing this behavior maybe well i think That's that we absolutely question. i think we absolutely can because we're able to drive cars and stuff like this so we're able to to be clear if i do this if i'm using a joystick to play some kind of game and it's uh recording my brain impulses and then they remove it so i've still got the joystick but the game is being played via my brain impulses if I stop touching the joystick and simply imagine moving it, will my brain produce the same activity it should. that can drive it? Uh, well, the, the answer is no, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah, the answer is no. Uh, and the reason is because the neurons that were being monitored aren't the same neurons, right? That would be... Exactly. Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, you may... Well, that's interesting, right? Because... I think that the neurons that would be inhibiting your muscles from moving would be downstream from the be from the imagination of the muscles moving. Hmm. Um, so you might still have to learn, have to train the thing to record your brain from the beginning without moving. You probably would, yeah. Well, and they do that with people, actually. <laughs> there are people who can move mouse mouses with the, and type and stuff with their brains quadriplegics oh. so this is like this this technology isn't new what's new about Neuralink specifically is is not the necessarily the technology itself it's uh or at least the ability to record or or interact it's it's the size and the the um the implementation okay uh, my understanding is that what makes Neuralink so special is that it's very, very tiny. The the fibers that they're the 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 robot that they designed to in, install the unit is incredibly complicated and and advanced. And then the unit itself is incredibly complicated and advanced, as well as all of the little nano wires that are required to actually record. Because even right. even with the wires, right? Like even if the wires are a, a one nanometer thick, right? That's still a thousand times bigger than than a neuron is, or than than what you're recording from is, 
right? The mm. neurons, the the um, what what's called a patch clamp in in neuroscience, the, the things that hook on directly to a um, uh, to it. What are those called? Enough? To an ion channel. Okay. That record a singular ion channel. ion channel, a patch clamp. Right. Those ion things, channels are the size of individual right. molecules. Those things are made from glass, and they're like pulled mm. <laughs> because you can't actually manufacture anything that small. The manufacturing of stuff that goes into brains is like absolutely insane. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that the the actual size of the electrodes that monitor the neurons matters. Mm -hmm. And that's what's and Neuralink's ability to monitor and implant a bunch of those is revolutionary. Um, so this technology is only going to get better. But it seems to me like what uh, this monkey's augmentation is limited to is motor cortex. Yep. And probably because that's fairly again, it's one of those easy impossibles. Right, right. It's just regular impossible to uh -huh. do that. To do that. Um, right, because we we actually understand like monkey brains pretty well, and we don't really understand exactly how everything's working. But lesion studies give us a pretty good indication of like what's going on and like where we need to to hook into to get information. Right. We know if we cut out the motor cortex we're not going to get any motor activity. And we know if we plug into the motor cortex, we're going to get the motor activation. Yeah, and we know where in the motor cortex specific. Yeah, yeah, everything is represented. Yeah, and if we don't know, we can just plug an electrode in and ask the person to move. Mm -hmm. I think the, the issue, or maybe not the issue necessarily, but uh, the technical difficulty moving forward with concepts of transhumanism specifically like implantation particularly brain implantation stuff is the the breadth of access that these devices might have right and maybe that will be some of the security that they 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 have is that you're you're going to be like well i certainly don't want the the neuralink to have access to my um, basal ganglia maybe or uh, i don't want it to have access to like anywhere that can that can manipulate my emotions right maybe i don't want it to be Unless... plugged into my prefrontal cortex at all maybe i mm -hmm. only want the neural link to be plugged into my motor cortex um maybe it I... would have and so Oh, I agree. And it would be more cost effective anyways. I mean, to do it for one specific task as opposed to have a general use thing. Right. I think a lot of people are going to want it to be um, plugged into their amygdala and yeah, their amygdala. Uh, <laughs> other, emotion, other emotional sense. Can you senses. imagine I being able to turn off fear completely? You become I, like you become un, mm, um, unrobable, right? Um, mm. Have you heard about these women who have no amygdala activation? There was a woman. I have not. A famous case study of a woman. You'll learn this. I mean, I remember this from psychology because I don't okay. know why, but um, the, it's famous. It's fascinating. Famously, she is. She was. There were multiple instances of her being robbed, and her lack of fear to the situation. Her complete just. She didn't respond to to anything that you know when people are robbing you that it's a it's a con essentially they're they're fearing you into giving you stuff by saying they're going to hurt yeah. you and most of them don't actually have the guts to do the hurting to actually do the violence to you uh, and this is proven by this woman who had no amygdala activation i believe they were either lesioned um, intentionally or they did not work and she did not respond to being robbed and people would run away from her when they would try to rob her because she just wasn't wow. afraid of them. And so the, the ability to, to, I guess, uh, somewhat inhibit or like, um, I don't know dampen. what the right dampen, um, temporarily lesion, an aspect of the brain, um, you know, by disinhibiting a certain neuron in that as in that part of the brain, 
might be incredibly valuable for soldiers, for special forces people who probably already have lower amygdala activation as it is, but, or maybe they have normal amygdala activation, but they found, um, you know, cognitive ways to suppress the behavior. And then when you actually suppress the behavior, they become like legitimately just grade A killers. I mean, it would be astonishing what you could do to somebody in the special forces who's who's trained themselves psychologically to encounter the beha- to encounter the fear and then just take it away. <laughs> I mean, you could only imagine yeah. what would be possible. Um, I mean, so. that that would start to get into the ethical issues that you described earlier, where if you're effectively producing uh, unfeeling killers, how many scientists are going to be willing to undertake that kind of research? I think my understanding currently in special forces training is it's less of a, like, it's cognitive, but it's, uh, it's a conditioning thing. You're brute force conditioning the brain to deal with fear. And then that stress response eventually, you know, you weed out 96% of the people who are incapable. And then the ones who are, um, we'll see. I don't know what trauma rates are with special forces versus the rest of the soldiery. That would be but, interesting, uh, actually. Applying no transhumanism to the brains of soldiers. Oh, I mean, that would be most likely officers? be the the next people who get it, right? Uh, after the paralyzed, right? The, because it's Probably. DARPA. It's DARPA who's paying for this research. Probably, and right. and that's certainly worthy of further investigation because. That that raises a few uh, extremely concerning prospects. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean would one, be... one would imagine a pilot that can control all of the guns on his aircraft with his mind. Well, even simply not not feeling fear, because fear exists for a reason. Uh, and those inhibitions exist for a reason. Now, it would be very good to address it from the level of trauma. And I think that is something that could filter down from the soldiery and from police forces to everyday citizens. Yeah, I mean, that would using be this, fascinating, actually, as far as re-experiencing. This, re-experiencing, yeah, and not having the uh, But you would out, also never get trauma. Activation. You would never get trauma if you were able to hinder some of those. Re- if you preemptively had it, yeah. It, well, I'm, if you I'm can stop to... re-experiencing, then you can prevent trauma. Yes, if yeah. you are, I, w- what I'm saying is unless these, because these aren't going to be implanted in children anytime soon. No, um, no, hopefully not. There will, be, there will be people who receive the technology who have already experienced trauma. Right, which, and, and then, then it would be a question of. Well, in that case, then you would be able to allow them to re-experience while deactivating certain aspects of their brain. Mm-hmm. And that's recreating, reformulating or re- uh, um, fuck, I can't remember what it's called. You you just you give them a new experience of the situation, right? They do this with like recontextualize soldier. it. Yeah, you recontextualize it, or you uh, like they do this right now with VR therapy in soldiers, where they have them like drive in a convoy, and then their convoy gets blown up because mm-hmm. there's a lot of soldiers who can't drive anymore, mm-hmm. and it's caused because of all the roadside IEDs. So what they do is they put them in a VR headset, which, you know, already is very immersive. And then they put them in a convoy and they have them drive and then they blow up their, their artificial virtual convoy. Now, what would aid in that therapy is if you had a neural link in those people, and then you were able to inhibit some of the behaviors. So that way, when they have the re-experience of that event, they can contextualize the event without any of the adrenaline, without any of the fear hormones, without any of the cortisol, right? And they can they can essentially experience their own trauma as a television show and actually feel as that as such. Right? Okay. Because there there's no emotional response. I mean, theoretically you could do this, right? Where you, and you know, that's in some ways that's that's really scary is that you could have, you know, you could essentially produce what's equivalently a psychopath or whatever somebody who could turn off all of those things and be a, a mindless, you know, a, an, an unempathetic killer. Yeah. I, you, if, if you're going in ahead of time, if you've already got the Neuralink going into the theater, yeah, that's possible. I think guaranteed there are going to be unintended consequences. 
it yeah. could be the case that if you turn off the adrenaline and the cortisol, you wind up with a really ineffective uh, unit that is not moving as quickly, is not as motivated or energized because the unit is not afraid. It's like a walk in the park. And that might yeah, be good true. for robbers, but when somebody is very much trying to kill you, right. fear is adaptive. Right. Fear exists for a reason. Most things in the brain were adaptive at one point. Well, Otherwise, okay. or at least not maladaptive. But wouldn't you? Would you then agree that like uh, psychopath, like certain behaviors that psychopaths have are socially adaptive, like their ability to to apparently have absolutely no social friction, pretty much. It depends. It's, that's pretty. It seems that's to be a combination of, of interesting parts. Is that the easiest way to find a psychopath is to find the most interesting and unique person in the room that everyone likes? Yeah. Yeah, they're outrageously yeah. charismatic, and what's right. fascinating, despite despite not empathizing with pain, because they have reduced pain thresholds, uh, but despite not empathizing with other people's pain, they've got incredible theories of mind, hmm. which is how they're able to manipulate people, how they're able to mess with somebody else and play people against each other because they can perceive how they are being perceived by others and how they can influence some, we're talking about the intelligent, narcissistic psychopaths. Most, most I think it's not very adaptive. At least on the, on the criminal level, it, they tend to be lower IQ. And it's simply, it, it's a disorder not being able to empathize with people. Right, and that. it does seem to be, like, psychopathology is only a, 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 we'll put it a benefit in air quotes, if you're raised well, right? Like, there's lots of CEOs mm. and very wealthy, successful people who are what we would consider psychopaths who benefit from all these behaviors, but don't commit murders. You know, they're just, I mean, most assholes. probably don't. they're just great. A assholes. Mm -hmm. right? And they don't care. They don't kill people because yeah, they don't care. They don't kill people because they get off murdering their opponents in business by destroying other people's companies and stealing other, you know, their assets and their ideas and concepts. And they get off on that kind of brutality as opposed to like real physical brutality. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, I hope that, and I think that that might be where people are kind of afraid of transhumanism a little bit is the, it's ability to change us so dramatically. I feel like that yeah, if one might could, be some of the pushback there. Well, if one could re-engineer one's brain and of course, the first people with access to this, aside from uh, folks, presumably, hopefully, uh, folks who need the technology and are granted access. Um, but otherwise, it's going to be the extremely wealthy. It's going to be soldiers and police funded by the government. And then it's going to be extremely wealthy individuals who, if they have the capacity to reduce fear and stress and reduce uh What's the word? Not guilt, um, but uh, empathy, remorse, remorse. Uh, sure. Yeah, uh, to become more effective business people, because then, especially especially in the corporate world, if he's working ten hours, it's a uh, it's another prisoner's dilemma thing. You know, if one guy's working ten hours, pretty soon everybody has to be doing that because the one who chooses not to uh, is out. So if one guy starts tweaking his brain in order to become a more effective negotiator, it'll, it, it'll eventually become required if you want to be in the C-suite. And then all of the world's major corporations that aren't already run mostly by psychopaths will be. All right. So, and if they, if you can't be a psychopath, you make yourself one or whatever that, is equivalent to the, yeah. The Cause that, I, it's, a, it's a very broad term. Uh, R. Scott Baker uses the term neuropath for a psychopath that has been engineered to be so. Oh, interesting. I always call those and, sociopaths. Well, that's psychologically conditioned. He's talking neuropath specifically, somebody who is neurologically, uh, exactly what we're talking about, using oh, machines and technology right, right, okay. to produce a psychopath or a sociopath. But you the can do that momentarily. That and that's the interesting thing about this, right? Is that you could just be a psychopath at work. 
and then you can go at home. You turn off the you turn off your C suite setting, and you're you're. Would you? I mean, what maybe. about the memories? Would you have to edit out your memories of that event? Well, I don't as well? know. That's interesting. How do you deal with de being different persons? Do people start to develop some type of neural link, you know, uh, multiple personality dissociative identity disorder type thing? Home setting. <laughs> Home setting. Yeah. I mean, it it seems to like that's absolutely something that would be reasonable. That people I'm would just wondering... want the, the, a certain edge at work and would want to go home and maybe be more suave, more whatever. I don't know. Whatever the, the negatives are of, of being ultra crazy at work. Whatever the oh, Usually it's your family part. hates you. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, usually it's you get home and nobody can stand being around the dinner table with you. Well, there you go. Maybe that that's the answer for these guys. So, but then the question, my question is, if one has a home setting where one is a kind, gentle, empathetic parent, because um, we we could certainly assume that women would use this to get ahead in corporate fields as well as men. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, would that individuals, and then this goes back to the question of self, or these one person or two different people, but would the kind, caring, empathetic individual remembering what they did at work that day feel remorse and regret? Maybe. I guess then it that depends would... on how those memories are encoded. My guess is probably not, but I don't know, actually. You... You think if it wasn't experienced with regret, it wouldn't be recalled at a later time with regret, even if somebody's got their uh, uh, ventromedial PFC back online? I mean, maybe, possibly, if they're thinking about those things, then they would... I don't know. That's it. I mean, it's impossible to know without actually doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my guess would be that you're, there would be so much dissonance there that you would probably like suppress it subconsciously or something. <laughs> or just leave one setting on. All and, that, and that would probably create like another type of pathology <laughs> where oh yeah, you have all these suppressed like psych pathological events that you're behaving in one setting and then in another setting you're completely different. I mean, who knows? There's lots of They've people already... who can do that. Without oh, do that but... cognitively? I I think I don't know. I can never tell whether they really can or whether they think they they're can. just acting. Oh, it's, that's hard. Uh, I mean, that was a fascinating thing I learned recently about lying. Did we talk about this? No, I don't think so. Time? Yeah, when when somebody says something that's so outrageous and you can't tell whether they are delusional and detached from reality or whether they're consciously lying. Okay. No, I don't think we've talked about this. Okay. Well, apparently it's both. Uh, apparently the best liars are the most self-deceptive. Oh, because yeah. they are able to deceive themselves and detach from reality to such an extent that when they tell the lie, they believe it. And so um, they don't give cues of lying, which we as humans are very good at picking up at. Right. Uh, they don't give any of the cues of lying because they have deluded themselves. It's a possible explanation for why self-deception exists to begin with, because Again, that doesn't seem very adaptive. But... Well, my understanding is um, deception exists, at least in primates, for, like, mate selection. Mm -hmm. You'll see, like, chimps cover their... Male chimps will cover their uh, their, gen their genitals when the the big male chimp shows up. When there's, like, a female mm. around and they, they might become aroused, they'll, they'll mm. hide their genitals to not show that they're being aroused. To, they'll lie that they're not aroused. Yeah. So, I mean, that, from my understanding, that is where a lot of evolutionary psychologists will point to the origins of lying. Mm -hmm. It is in mate selection, yeah. uh, which, I mean, yeah. was adaptive, but as, like, it becomes more informational-based and information relates to an infinite number of concepts, that infinite number of concepts then can become reality. Um, instead of you covering oh, yeah. your genitals, right? That's a that's a very limited set of circumstances that you can lie about in that in that circumstance. But then when you add language and lying together, and language being, you know, in the information sphere, you know, existing in some like aleph higher than reality, 
right? You can you can make up stuff that doesn't apply to reality directly, right? It maybe applies to like different points on the infinite aspect of, of the line that is reality, but like it's been conglomerated in this decimal number that is language up above it. Okay. If that makes any sense. Uh, kind of. <laughs> I, I followed you. And that's something that sociopaths and psychopaths tend to be really good at is lying. It's like a diagonalization of the truth. That's what lying is. It's like taking it's like if it's like drawing a line across the truth and just picking that as the new truth. It's diagonalizing the truth. That's mm. that's my opinion. Cuz it's still in a mathematical it's still coherent. System. Yeah, it's still coherent. It still follows the same rules. It's just mm-hmm. diagonalized. You just mm. took the words, you just took ideas or concepts from reality that exist on the real line. We'll just call it the real line, right? And then you you diagonalized it. <laughs> you just created a totally new number, <laughs> new concept that doesn't exist and doesn't apply, right? It's it's there's no one to one relationship between that new yep. number and the numbers that created it. Anyway, and it has to do with the the sheer fact that there are a lot more false sentences than true sentences. Yeah, and I think the reason for that is because the true sentence is fixed to reality, which is a less complicated system than than language is. Language is, I I honestly think so. I I honestly that's a strong claim. Yeah, yeah. I honestly think that that reality itself is uh, is an alpha lower than language. Whatever because language. You- Language is a meta is a meta layer above, in the same way that the natural or the the, the natural numbers. It, I think I, my personal opinion is that reality and language have the same relationship as the natural numbers and the decimals. Hmm. Yeah, that's because language exists. Oh, but duh, because the decimals exist within the naturals. Um, right, but they're bigger. Hmm. Yeah. So in in a fractal <laughs> sense, even though language exists within reality, it's it's a bigger more than it's, it's bigger than reality. Sense. It must be that's fascinating because you can diagonalize reality and create new thing. You can diagonalize sentences that index reality and create a new sentence in language that's bigger than the reality. Wow. Yeah, I mean that seems like <laughs> a proof actually. <laughs> I mean, if we're using diagonalization, that's a proof. I mean, in some sense. I mean, it, it, we'd have to write it down a little bit more formally, but it, if you use you should do that, I don't really care. <laughs> I do. That is fascinating. Well, I'm, I'm surprised nobody's I'm, ever said that before because it seems patently I mean, obvious that that's true. Have. Well, maybe they have. Yeah. I mean, that's the interesting and partially sad part about academia. And the reason that we're doing this podcast is that these ideas are never really discussed in public. And if they are, they're hidden behind huge paywalls and other mm-hmm. stuff right if i wanted to go find it the, the only way i would be able to find it is if i had access to a a university uh library because i would i would need access to all the journals and all the mathematical journals probably and maybe linguistics i don't even know like where you would <laughs> where you would find that or if somebody's even had an interest uh, in I those two topics formal logic that theory and epistemology and and linguistics yeah the problem is see the issue is that most of those researchers doing that work are not at all talking with um or at least weren't talking with like computer scientists and the cosmologists and the set theorists which is where that concept comes from right Mm -hmm. comes from the idea that you have the null set right and everything manifests itself from the null set that in in our current understanding of mathematics, you start from nothing and build one from nothing, two from nothing, three from nothing, and so on. Everything's built from emptiness. From the empty yeah. from the emptiness in the box. Yeah, the that's what that's what our math is built on. <laughs> is mm-hmm. the, the nothing. <laughs> oh wow. Oh yeah. And that's just astonishing. Speaking of nothing, there was yeah. the S&P 500 and 
Oh boy, How man! It, what an absolute really, disaster! Let's let's look. It? Let's look. Yeah, they're me... they're forecasting. You should actually look because they are forecasting a recession. But oh, I, well, I, I'm I mean, not seeing let's that. let's start this segment like I start. Uh, I am not. I do not have a degree in finance. I do not have an MBA. I do not have an accounting degree. I have no certifications at all when it comes to finance. All I have are my opinions, and this podcast is only a reflection of such. Oh, we have our opinions and Google. And we Google. have data. <laughs> and and data oftentimes is more important than any number of talking heads with any number of degrees. All right. Let's look at the S&P 500. I'm telling you, man, we're up about a quarter percent today from may of 2020 from may of 20 from may of 20 or sorry from may of 2020 we're up but overall if we look at today well if we look at june 22nd sorry that can't be since it's not june 22nd oh no it's june 13th on the 6th it fell here let me see if i can get a more if you go to Google, just search S and P five hundred on Google. It gives a prettier graph. Does it? I'm all about the aesthetics. It did drop about a hundred points. Uh, uh, I don't want to Google. From the fifteenth to the sixteenth. Yeah, we had about a two hundred point drop. All right, here's the graph. That's the day graph. This is the five-day graph, the one-month graph. We are just not looking good. That's, yeah, so that's today. Five-day on the downslope, one month. One month, yeah, six months on the downslope, year-to-date on the downslope. Just not. But if we look at five-year, to be fair, overall, if you put money in, on March 20th of 2020, <laughs> you would have done just fine. Yeah. Now we are that. Ooh, that's interesting. It's, it where does look like a correction. To, yeah. Like where are saying. we relative to February 14th of 2020? February 14th. It's, it's the top of the correction. Right there. So we're, we're about 300. Back. Yep, we're about we're about back. And I will obviously see the same thing with uh Bitcoin as well. Bitcoin has yeah, uh, fallen quite a bit since we recently talked about it. It fell all the way down to This is actually not a correct reflection. Oh wait, this is the 5-day. Here there you go. Fell all the way down to 17,633. Oh, is it rebounding? It's rebounding currently. Oh, nice. But it's, this is this is this this right here is this is not gonna stay if i had to guess my i i would not put any money in bitcoin right now it it is not a good idea if you just don't do it i mean yeah. don't fomo this in my personal opinion man i mean it looks good right now but the projections i like if if we see this six month this one month i mean it's leveled out but if we draw a line Right, it's still headed down. The five the Dow day is down today. The Dow is down too. Let's look at Dow. The Dow is down today. Um, yep. Yeah, the Dow year is to down. day. Ooh. And obviously it was yeah, Juneteenth well, today. Happy Juneteenth, everybody! This video, this video is being recorded on Juneteenth. Um. It is. That's yes, something we yesterday was talk Juneteenth. About today. But well, it's the Juneteenth, uh, Juneteenth Juneteenth federal holiday today. Yep, which is a great thing that they're observing. So we get to celebrate sure. it twice, which is mm -hmm. just wonderful. What's not wonderful, though, is the unfortunate fact that although the telegraph existed, it took two and a half years to free all of the slaves in this country after the Emancipation Proclamation, and it had to be enforced by federal troops. Mm -hmm. So yep. I'm sorry for all our viewers from Texas, but... uh you guys are unfortunately the last race estate. So, 
it's, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality that we live in. The last one to have slaves, the last one to continue to practice slavery. It's unfortunate, but you know, my my judgment is based on that fact alone. <laughs> I don't include all the Jim Crow laws from the South or anything like that. Perhaps yeah, it's say, just a, an artifact of the ability for the, the federal government to move across the country. Yeah, well, they, they had to put the federal troops in to enforce that. And then when they withdrew them, uh, all the black Americans who'd been elected to Congress were forcibly unelected and in some cases murdered. That's uh, Texas just recently, Texas Republicans just recently passed a resolution claiming that they believe Biden did not win the 2020 election. They're going with the conspiracy theories and... Uh, they they are they are resolved that he is only an acting president. <laughs> that's, that's astonishing to me. I wonder. If, it's not the least bit astonishing to me. How? It, but what what's strange about that is that they don't dispute any of the other election results. Right. The the right. Other, any any of the people that won for them. That that doesn't count. Those those votes aren't spurious. It's only the votes for president that are spurious, and that I think is yeah. the most astonishing part of this all whole thing. The the amount I'm of cognitive that. dissonance that you must have to be able to sustain in order to believe that is just incredible to me. I I just yeah. don't know how what, and I, I guess this goes back to to being a really good liar, right? Like if you can yes, if you does. can live in an alternate reality, then I guess it doesn't matter. No, <laughs> you're absolutely correct. Is. The cognitive dissonance is a feature. The the deliberate, blatant contravention of reality and forcing people, not forcing, but encouraging people to accept a very obvious contradiction is how you get people who are fanatically, obsessively supportive. It's... It, it, the... Uh, Hearing a paradox, hearing somebody say something and then immediately contradict themselves, who, whom you respect and believe in, it produces a light trance state. It's, it's literally mind-altering. It's meditative because your, your brain is forced to accept this uh, contradiction, and it can't, so it just stops thinking. Mm. And so that is why demagogues, charismatic demagogues, so often appear like buffoons from the outside and sound like you would have to be crazy in order to believe this because yes, you would. And the very act of believing it is what causes, what breaks a person's cognition and causes them to, to become followers. Cause you know this, if you have a, a, a contradiction, P equals not P baked into your argument, you can prove anything. Oh yeah. Yeah. Any contra you know. contradiction proves anything, but it's not valid. Or it's not, it's it yeah, a contradiction is valid reasoning. It's just not sound. It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. And Even that, apparently with access to information, it does not have to be sound. And then people will point out certain circumstances where P and not P is true, or at least they think P and not P is true. Mm -hmm. yeah. My point is that if you try to convince a whole crowd of people to, uh, hate and you know go out and like burn something down whatever try to invade the capital whatever you're trying to do if you're trying to get a whole crowd of people to do the thing using reasoning you're going to fail but if you do it by deliberately using flawed reasoning you're more likely to get them to do that because the ones that you have it's the same reason that nigerian telephone scammers are uh, not telephone but the email scams are so obviously Back. Wrong. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. It's because they're not looking for the people who are going to spot that. They're seeking out the people who will accept the contradiction, who will accept the lack of logic. That's their target demographic. That's why they do it. Right. Yeah. And it so, seems like now we're we've transitioned from using that to extort people from their money to extort people for their votes. And that mm -hmm. right because there were. We're extorting them in the sense that we're we're in a lot of cases working against their best interests by giving them false information yep. or obstructed information. And that I think is probably one of the greatest evils of modern politics. 
unfortunately is it like mm, I mean, it's just it's not the <laughs> it's just not there's no truth or honesty or perspective on really trying to get it's it's more just playing around in this language space where yep. everything is loosely related to reality and maybe one point but not in the same place and not in the same way i wouldn't say that's a feature of modern politics either well i'd say could... politics has always been about information management fair enough but well speaking of politics our last topic for yeah. the day McConnell supports the bipartisan gun control bill. He supports the framework. <clears throat> the it's framework. The framework. What does that even mean? Tell us more. Mike. Uh, <laughs> Tell us more. <clears throat> what it means, I don't have that pulled up. I was going to. There were some interesting origins of uh, the S&P, but we got. Um, I, I got sidetracked on to. Uh, radicalization effectively there were a lot of things that folks wanted that aren't going to be happening but overall uh, it seems like in terms of getting votes it seems like even the senate gop has realized that uh they're simply not going to be able to maintain popular support even in texas now that texas school children are being slaughtered yeah and now, what what they don't support? See, this was this was interesting. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay, the framework they agreed to. This is under key background. Sunday would allow the federal firearm background check system to scan juvenile records for prospective gun buyers under the age of 21, and would block gun sales to a broader swath of people with domestic violence convictions or restraining orders. It also invests in school security measures and offers funding for states with red flag laws. That's interesting. Offers funding for states with red flag laws. If your state does not have the red flag law, your state does not receive money. That's how they got the uh, uh, blood alcohol content limit of 0 0.08 instantiated nationwide. A lot of states were holding out on that. They said, okay, fine, you don't want to make 0 0.08 the limit. We won't give you highway funding. So they're using the pocketbook, which is good. Uh, the deal, and it allows judges to temporarily take away guns from people deemed a risk to themselves or to others. The deal stops short of many Democratic lawmakers' ambitions. It doesn't ban AR-15 style assault rifles or high capacity magazines, make background checks mandatory for private gun sales, or raise, raise the age limit for buying a semi-automatic rifle from 18 to 21. And it also doesn't uh, create police, it doesn't make police officers stop the person from entering the building in the first place either, right? Which is a sad reality that we're dealing with, with this gunman, oh, is that there was a police, I, we now know that there was a police officer chasing him with an AR-15 drawn and did not fire because the officer was afraid of shooting children playing on the playground behind him. We now know, Whoa. we now know that a good guy with a gun, a police officer with a gun, apparently, is not sufficient to stop a bad guy with a gun. That is crazy. Absolutely astonishing to me. How you can be a police officer and do that is, I've, I honestly feel like policing in this country has a gigantic problem on both sides. Don't, they are not willing to shoot the people who need to be shot, and they are shooting the people who don't need to be shot. And this is just Agreed. absolutely insane. I don't know what mm -hmm. is wrong with policing in America. I don't know what needs to change, but something needs to change. Uh, but if you're if you're not able to shoot the people that need to be shot, and you're shooting the people who don't need to be shot, you're not policing. You're executing people in the street, and you're allowing people to execute people in schools. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that no argument um, from any Texan um, is going to be able to overcome that specific instance. Um, that, you know, and I feel like that, that's one of the reasons that we're not seeing a ban on AR-15 assault rifles. That, and I, statistically, the data, once again, uh, is thin. Like, it's horrifying. It is absolutely horrifying what these rifles do to a human body, no question. It's still, the last time I checked, they account for about 
two, it's like maybe two percent. three percent. Yeah, handguns uh, is most of the violence in this country. Yes. Yep. So what the what the framework does, uh, that can be applied just as easily to handguns as automatic weapons, and I think that's going to reduce a much greater amount of gun violence. Now, as is always the case, these laws will probably be applied disproportionately to underserved communities, to people in poverty, to people of color, as, as since Reagan initiated some of the first gun control measures in California uh, in the 80s, to, or not in the 80s, but when he was governor of California in the 60s or 70s in order to retaliate against the Black Panthers who were trying to use the Second Amendment to defend themselves. Um, that's not going to change. And I completely agree with you on policing. That is not uh, going to change anytime soon. And that needs a serious overhaul. That being said, bans on AR-15s would be largely symbolic. It would make it more difficult to perform this specific kind of mass execution, mass murder. It wouldn't. High capacity magazines more broadly, um, it would just take more time, and it's you would a, have yeah. to carry more ammunition. Well, it just doesn't uh, seem to me like it prevents somebody from auto, from buying a device that makes the their their pistol automatic, and then just carrying uh, hollow points. I mean, it, it's it, it yeah, and the you destructive can get a power is virtually it. no different. I mean, you're Ooh. still you're still mutilating bodies, man. If you have yeah, an automatic that. pistol that shoots thirty rounds in ten seconds or two seconds or however long, right? It doesn't a round, matter. A pistol round is slightly more survivable, like, but thirty remember, of them Gabby, aren't. No, Gabby Giffords got shot in the head with a nine millimeter. Like, if right. you're using nine millimeter, and and there have been instances of people being shot multiple times by nine millimeters they're fatal but they're not immediately fatal right so but yeah if you're using a 45 if you're using fragmenting rounds um if you've got a stock on the pistol and uh, and a laser sight then yeah it's uh while death is death is my point here yes yeah death is death and the 223 is more destructive but it is so over the top more destructive because it's designed to be used in situations where other people are wearing body armor so I think I think the AR-15 specifically that issue is uh, it's moot, essentially. It's more or less moot now. Yeah. It, in terms of folks who are thinking that Joe Biden wasn't lawfully elected and who have an interest in exercising their Second Amendment rights on a national scale, it's not moot, and that's one of the reasons that a lot of people are so intent on keeping military style assault rifles they say that the second amendment the right to keep and bear arms specifically applies to military hardware because that's what they had back during the war for independence but it doesn't apply to grenade yeah. launchers it doesn't apply to bazookas it doesn't apply to right like it doesn't yeah. it, there's a lot there are, well, uh, there are many military weapons that you can't purchase as a civilian that it is significantly more difficult to purchase. Well, yeah, I guess with the right tax stamp, like, anybody, if you have enough money, exactly. you can buy pretty much yeah. anything you want. If you have the right yeah, tax stamp. Yeah, in the right state. Um, like you, uh, maybe not here, but you it, have is, to have it a, is still relatively easy to, to buy an license. AR-15. You'd have to have an, a, goes, you'd have to have an ATF uh, license you need to a, sell yeah, firearms, you need a, Well, yeah, you need to find a person with a Class 3 dealer's license. Yeah, and you'd you'd probably need to be, you probably need to be that mm -hmm. person. <laughs> or know that person. if you're if you're that uh, interested in owning firearms like that you probably would need to be that person it's not that hard to become one it's a background check and three hundred dollars away for anybody yep. who is interested but apparently will not take a background check to just get a standard issue military style assault rifle yeah and i mean However, that's fair for... it's it's a it's it's a part of our constitution, I think, at this point. And... It's a part of our constitution. The arguments are on the surface, not entirely invalid. Like again, the the Black Panthers were targeted for 
exercising their right to self-defense. That's what initiated a lot of California's initial gun laws. Uh, there's There have been groups like the Pink Pistols uh, encouraging LGBT individuals to get concealed carry permits, learn how to defend themselves. Uh, there, are, there are lots of progressive arguments for individuals who are not well served by law enforcement being able to legitimately exercise their right to self-defense. Right. And that's why while these red flag laws and these measures could be abused, uh, the fact is I think this is overall a fairly decent compromise in that it was so obvious that this guy was going to do something like this guy right. in Texas in the Texas schools, um, he was say he was talking about it. People knew that he was unbalanced. There, there was no real doubt. It seems at least amongst his friends or amongst anybody who followed his Facebook profile, right. That he was saying a lot of horrifying things. Now there are probably a lot of people out there who say things like that, who don't do anything and they would get caught up in that net. But the fact of the matter is if you're making statements like that publicly, then yes, that should draw attention. Yeah, if like you're willing that, to say that kind of stuff on a pub, mm -hmm. in a public forum, you have issues. Because you yeah, think there you are people issues. who are going to validate you. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there are. Yeah, well, that's part of the problem this as is, well. Yeah. yeah, this has been a running joke on 4chan for over a decade. <laughs> uh, wow, okay. I didn't know yeah, 4chan. The term, oh, no, 4chan, uh, all, man, all the time, back in... Back in the bad old days of 08, 09, go on B, talk about an hero at a school. Yeah, it's been, it is a joke. You can find people out there who will validate anything. So when you're fo posting on it on Facebook, a, fam a friend or a and family to, member. To be clear, that it's, it's not a good joke. It's just a joke that is on the internet that we're discussing yeah. as, as it's related to terrible acts that people perform. Just yes, to be clear. you're right. Uh, what I mean is people treat it with humor which is appalling right uh now so yeah will this again will, will this expose some people given that um the differently abled and neurodivergent folks are more likely to be victims of crimes than perpetrators uh there's a chance that this could have negative outcomes things always do but the sim the sheer and simple fact that 10 senate republicans and Mitch McConnell are on board is astonishing. And <laughs> I think it's a bit of positive news. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think uh, that's probably where we should end it on our positive news. Sure. Positive ish. <laughs> maybe right direction with unforeseen unintended consequences. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> and thanks for everyone watching. We appreciate it. We'll be back this Friday at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Thanks for watching the Clarifying, Podcast, Clarifying Thought Podcast. This has been Mike and Dave. <laughs>